Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Vera. She is an ASL interpreter, and she shares a bit about her life on TikTok and just all of the great things that she's doing, helping some great people. So I'm really excited to learn more about her and hear about her life. So Vera, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Vera. I am an ASL English interpreter from Ontario, Canada, and I am also a CODA, which is an acronym that means child of deaf adults. Both of my parents are deaf. I also have a deaf aunt. Um, I've grown up in the deaf community. ASL is my first language, and I have spent my whole life working and volunteering and just being a part of the deaf community. It's something that I absolutely love doing. I also run a side business called Sing and Sign Princess Parties, where we provide uh, popular characters for children, sometimes adults as well, with um, special needs or sometimes just really big Disney fans, um, with a focus on being accessible for everybody. So I make sure that all of my performers are trained in. We have something called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, are familiar with Uh, working with individuals that have different abilities and are at least semi-fluent in sign language, preferably completely fluent. So what was it like growing up then with both of your parents being deaf? Did you have any siblings or was it just you? I have two brothers. Both of them are also able to hear. About 95% of children that are born to deaf parents are hearing. And the opposite statistic is true for children that are deaf. 95% of their parents are able to hear. Um, I've always had a hard time answering that question because deaf parents is my normal. I don't know what it's like to have hearing parents, but I can give some examples of ways that like I had to interpret my own parent teacher interviews or uh, the lights flashed in my house when the doorbell rang or the phone rang or I never talked to my parents on the phone directly. We used a relay service called the Bell Relay Service. Now you would use a video relay service, but at the time it was through um, a TTY, teletypewriter, and an operator, and it was like a three-way conversation. So those are ways that my life was different. But other than that, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to have parents who hear. <laughs> so what was it like then with your siblings who who are able to hear Um Are they also as ingrained in the deaf community as you are? Not really. My middle brother is not really involved in the deaf community. He he can sign to communicate with my parents well enough, but other than that, not super involved. He works in like mechanics. My youngest brother doesn't work in the deaf community, but he does support um, children of different abilities. He's an educational resource worker for a school board here in Ontario. He's fluent in sign language, he uses sign language, and he volunteers at the same camp that I do still as well. So then what was it like deciding to start this princess business? It kind of just fell into my lap. It's something that people had remarked that I would be good at doing for a long time. I love working with kids. I'm a huge Disney fan, of course, and people have just said that I I would make a good princess, but I didn't know how to go about starting a company or auditioning for a company that was already existing. I didn't think I was a good enough singer. I didn't think that I really had the sort of princess thing that they all seemed to have. But I had a friend from church who was a company owner herself, and she closed her company in order to focus on her current career. And she approached me and said, hey, listen, this is something I think you'd be good at, and I will train you in all of the ways that you need to be trained. And I will give you all of my costumes because I feel like it's so important to have a company out there that is accessibility focused. Um, And yeah, so that's kind of how that happened. So it was like a real blessing, a right place, right time, right person, and everything just kind of came together. And what is it like dressing up and being a princess? It is so much fun. (laughs) I love getting to meet kids and just seeing their face light up when they meet their favorite characters. 
and the added measure, like I just did a Halloween visit with a, a little deaf girl the other day as Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas, and it's her favorite Halloween character. It's her favorite Halloween movie. And she saw me and she was excited to see me. But then I started signing to her and she just cried happy tears. She was so, so happy to communicate with her favorite character, not just meet them, but interact with them. Right. Now, I believe you do all of your own makeup. Yes, I do. So something that I was taught um, and something that I believe to be true is that um, quality costumes, quality wigs are important, but also being able to change your face so that you can look as much like the character as possible. So I do all of my own makeup and it is a lot of fun. I love playing with makeup. I think makeup exists to have fun with. Um, I wear a lot of makeup, not just because I like, I look tired because I have three children, but um, <laughs> because I think it's fun and I love playing with the different colors and I love trying new things. Right. I I always find it completely fascinating. Anyone who does anything with makeup. So like specifically like cosplaying and doing like aiming to look like a character. I'm always very impressed uh, with the outcomes. Yeah, there are people that I follow on TikTok that are like leagues above me in terms of talent and skill. And I, I just want to be able to do what they do someday. And, and hopefully with enough practice, I will. But I'm pretty happy with what I'm able to do now. And I think that I'm able to provide a pretty quality service and have fun with it as well, which I think is the most important part. So switching more uh, to the interpreting side of things, what is the day-to-day responsibility of being an interpreter? It depends on the day because I am, I have two interpreting hats that I wear. I have a contract where I'm an interpreter for individuals that are newcomers to Canada at a program where they're learning written English and ASL with the goal of becoming Canadian citizens. So they can book me for whatever they need me for during the 15 hours a week that I'm contracted to be there. And by be there nowadays, it's mostly virtual, but <laughs> but uh, I'm available to them for whatever they need, whether it's a dentist appointment, doctor's appointment, job interview, citizenship test, everything. Um, and then I also work as a freelance sign language interpreter. And so that is where people can contact me directly for whatever their interpreting needs are. And I go to different assignments daily. So I have two funerals this week. I had a wedding earlier this month. Lots of doctor's appointments. Um, I did Fan Expo um, Toronto earlier this month. So anywhere that you or I would go, deaf people also go, but they need access. And that's where I come in. And is it difficult specifically with like doctor's appointments and like medical jargon and to kind of expand that knowledge? Because I feel like I forget terms in like spoken language to then also be like you weren't learning I would guess those things when you were first learning ASL as your first language no and it's also a big reason that I'm an advocate of why codas shouldn't be used as interpreters especially when they're children because we don't have the terminology the world worldliness we don't have the vocabulary we don't have the confidentiality agreement we're not non-partial as CODAs. And so they shouldn't be used as interpreters. You you should use qualified interpreters as much as possible because of confidentiality, because we study in order to be able to interrupt the doctor and say, I'm sorry for the interpreter. I don't quite understand what that is. Would you mind explaining it to me so that I could better explain it to the deaf person? Um, Or ask for preparation materials ahead of time so that we can read up on certain things and become well-informed. Interpreters are are like um, jack of all trades, master of none. Like we know a little bit about every single thing that we have to do. Um, And I'm thankful and very privileged to be able to do that because I do learn a lot personally that I can retain for future appointments or um, even future benefits. Right. Now, because you're freelance, do you tend to get requests from the same people? It depends. So there are a couple of things that I do annually that are sort of repeat consumers and repeat requests. Um, And then there's just kind of word of mouth. People are like, oh, that's the interpreter that 
you know, knows a little bit of Italian. So she's good at doing Catholic funerals. And I get booked for a lot of those. <laughs> um, so um, word of mouth in the community, um, people will search just for interpreter. Um, and my name pops up on a couple of sites here and there. There's a musician that I've been working with. Um, he's a Canadian um, country indie singer, and he has been learning sign language and has been really interested in incorporating sign language into his music videos and his performances because he wants it to make his music accessible to a broader community. And so um, people will often find me through his stuff, <laughs> which is kind of cool, like really roundabout ways. So people can find me kind of all over the place, sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose, and sometimes it's repeat people. <laughs> Now, you mentioned that um, as a child, like you did interpret like parent teacher conferences, but that you also recommend and advocate that you shouldn't have had to have done that as a child. So did you have times when you were a child where you weren't your parents interpreter? I was as the oldest child, I was always the default interpreter. If my parents needed one, my dad and my aunt were both brought up oral deaf. Um, my grandmother spent a lot of time teaching them how to speak and read lips, and they're both very skilled at doing that. My dad was the lead accountant at a hydro firm for until he retired, and he managed all hearing people. He was the only deaf person. So for one-on-one -on -one conversations, he was fine reading lips, and he could understand, and they could write emails back and forth or write notes, and that worked really well for him. But in a group setting, he would require an interpreter. Um, my aunt, same thing. She worked at a bank for many years. She was the only deaf person in her department. My mom lost her hearing when she was three, and she was born in Italy, and she didn't um, immigrate to Canada until she was 11-ish. So she has an Italian accent still and is difficult for other people to understand, and she doesn't read lips as well because English isn't her first language. Um, and so she would rely on me a little bit more as an interpreter. But my dad was really good about if we were at a restaurant or something and he wanted to speak to the waitress, he would say, don't use my children, look at me. And he would talk a person through how to communicate with a deaf person. Whereas my mom was a little bit more timid about doing that. And she would rely on us a little bit more for really serious things. My parents tried their best to get interpreters, but as I was growing up, it, the accessibility was not as good. It's still not great but it was really terrible back then. And so um, deaf parents did rely on their CODA children a lot more than parents nowadays have to. And so then you now have children. So are they also learning sign language? I'm working on it. <laughs> My oldest daughter, when she was three months old, she could recognize the sign for milk. Like we just started with her right away. We did milk more and all done and by the time she was three months old she could recognize it and she would react to it she couldn't sign back or anything but she could react to it by the time she was six months old she started signing back and by the time she was a year old she had a vocabulary of about 100 signs which is great and then as she learned to speak more that tapered off because she wanted to speak more and now that she's almost seven for the past couple of years she understands that nona and granddad are deaf and that she needs to communicate with them with her hands. And so she's been learning more sign language. My middle daughter just turned four and she is at that age now where she understands that Nona and granddad need her to communicate with her hands. So she will ask me what certain signs are here and there. My youngest is very cute, but <laughs> very stubborn, <laughs> very strong-willed. And she flat out refuses. So I'm hoping that she's only two, I'm hoping that as she gets older, she'll also recognize that and she'll also start picking it up. But she, even as a baby, just flat out refuses to use sign language. I don't know why she's so anti-sign language. Oh, gosh. And what about um, like other people in your life, friends, relationships, like, you know, coming to your house, say, as like a child, um, or then like later in life, having to introduce your parents and explain, you know, my parents are deaf, like my dad can read lips or, or whatever the story might be. It varied here and there. So our neighborhood friends were really good about it. My parents were friends with all of the other parents that kind of were around our house. And they would babysit us and uh, my parents would babysit their kids. And 
they got it and understood and were pretty good about it. And even though my friends, maybe they pick up a sign here or there, they didn't sign fluently, but they got it. You know, they'd make sure my parents were looking at them when they wanted to talk to them and things like that. In middle school, I was bullied very badly, um, specifically because I had deaf parents, people who wanted me to take advantage of them um, in order to like have a party at my house or something like stupid. And I refused to do that. And so I got bullied very badly in middle school. In high school, people thought it was cool. And so they learned signs here and there. In post-secondary, when I was at college, um, there was a little bit of tension in my class. There was me and one other CODA. And people thought it was unfair that we had such a background in sign language already going into the interpreter program, whereas most people didn't. They had maybe a couple years of signing under their belt. And it's the only time in my life it was ever thought of as an advantage. So that was really weird for me. Um, but nowadays, my best friends are my friends that I've met at Deaf Camp. Um, they are that just they sign fluently. They get it. They've been in the community. They volunteered. Um, and so they're the people that I relate to the most. And that's why they're my best friends. Right. So because ASL was your first language, when you were learning to speak, was that also at home or was that more in school? Both of my parents, because they were raised at a time where um, my Nona and Nono and my grandparents were told not to use sign language because there was a belief at the time that they would end up being um, special needs. The word that they used was the R word, but that's what doctors believed at the time. And so parents were told not to teach their kids sign language. And so my parents grew up at a time where oralism was very strong. And so they can both speak. My dad speaks pretty well. He has that deaf accent. My mom is a little bit more difficult for other people to understand, but she sounds normal to me. And so they did speak with me, but because they can't hear how words are supposed to be pronounced, I had a lot of pronunciation issues because as a child, you copy the way your parents say things. And I'm thankful that I had other relatives that stepped in and would help correct. When I was really little, I was stubborn and I was like, no, my mom said it's this way. And my mom had to intervene and be like, listen, I can't hear. They know better than me. Like, you have to listen. <laughs> um, and then as I got older, that's, there's still words that I have trouble mispronouncing. And also some of my language influences were people who are first language Italian users. And so there are some words that I say in a more Italian way because that's how they taught me to say it. And it's just a whole mishmash, but <laughs> I think I speak articulately now. <laughs> right. Well, and hearing that you were very stubborn as a child is probably why you're youngest. I know. Where did you get it from? <laughs> so one of the things that you've talked about on TikTok is so like ASL stands for American Sign Language. You're in Canada. Yes. Uh, so there are different sign languages. Can you talk a little bit about what that is like? Sure. So American Sign Language is the sign language of North America so the majority of deaf community members in the United States and Canada use ASL. In Canada, we have a lot more regional variations. And so in the Maritimes, so um, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, like that eastern part of Canada, they have maritime sign language, which is pretty different. Um, but a smaller population that uses it, mostly older deaf people, ASL has mostly moved out there and taken over. There's LSQ, which is Langue de Signe de Quebecois. It's the sign language that is used in Quebec by French signing people. Um, and then we have multiple indigenous sign languages. I'm not sure exactly the number, but there are multiple indigenous and Inuit sign languages. And is it similar with like speaking and accents and different regional things that you can get by on some of it to be able to still communicate through sign or is it kind of completely different that you're going to have to communicate in a completely different way if you do not speak the same sign language? If we're talking about, say, ASL users in Canada versus ASL users in the United States, there are some differences that 
you would miss a word here or there because it's signed differently. For example, the sign for rude is different. Um, and you would have to use what are called your close skills, C-L-O-Z-E. And that's basically what people who lip read do as well, is they, you, they pick the words you know, and then you fill in the gap with the word that makes the most sense in order to complete the sentence. And so that's how that would work. If we're talking about sign languages from, say, um, uh, ASL versus BSL, which is an entirely different alphabet even, they use a two-hand manual alphabet, we use a one-hand alphabet, then, I mean, they're both English-speaking countries, but say it's just sign language, they would use what's called a contact language, where they would move to more of a gestural form of communicating with each other, and that's how they would communicate. So um, they wouldn't use formal sign language, they would use gestures or international sign, and those are more recognized around the world as, you know, things that you would just know what they are saying by the gesture that they're using, right? Like things like making a roof over your head for home or, you know, um, using your hands to make the shape of a book and moving it back and forth in front of your eyes, like you're reading, like that kind of thing for school. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, do you find... Or, well, I actually don't know. I guess I should first ask, have you had the opportunity to travel outside of Canada? Yes, I have. Um, not to the extent that I would love to. Our 10-year anniversary was this past year. And guess what? COVID. So, um, <laughs> um, But I've been to um, a bunch of different states. I've been to Dominican, Jamaica, like a bunch of places in the Caribbean. Um, I did a wedding in Dominican where we met a deaf individual that went to school down there. Um, he took us on a tour and we had somebody um, in the wedding that was also a deaf interpreter. Um, so an individual who is deaf and a native user of the language. And because they are deaf, it's more inherent for them to be able to code switch and meet the needs of the person that they're communicating with. Whereas with hearing people, we are not so capable of doing that. Like CODA is a little bit different, a little bit more able to do that. But um, most interpreters, because they are second language users of ASL, they are not. And so she was able to mediate between most of the group and this individual. And we were able to learn about them and their life in Dominican. And that was pretty cool. But again, I work with newcomers to Canada. So they come here and I get to meet them and learn about their life. Right. Well, because I was going to ask, have you found that when you like leave the nest, um, you know, kind of walk away from your job for a little bit on a vacation that you are still signing or meeting other people who are deaf? Not so much meeting people that are deaf, but I sign, it's because it's my first language. If I forget a word in English, I usually know it in sign language. And I'm like, uh, it's this. And people are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, you don't know sign language. That's right. Or if we're in like a quiet room that I feel the need to communicate in sign language and then people are like, that's weird. Um, yeah. And, and especially even if you meet people who speak a different language, you default to gesturing back and forth. And I feel like for those of us that are sign language users, we're a little bit better at making the gestures make sense and getting our point across. And do you find that people are more willing to learn sign language nowadays, maybe compared to like when you were younger, not compared to when your parents were younger and they were kind of specifically told, don't learn it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that with social media and with cameras everywhere, you're capturing um, interpreters and deaf people all over the place and deaf people are able to put out their own content in their own language because everything is so visual nowadays that sign language has never been more um, in the public eye and especially with COVID and um, a lot of the briefings being accessible for the first time ever um, in Canada, like I know in the States, you have the ADA, which has been in existence till, since the 70s. But in Canada, we have it, we don't have that. We have the Charter of Human Rights, but that only guarantees you an interpreter in a courtroom setting. And there are a couple of Supreme Court rulings that um, require 
um, hospitals and other places to provide interpreters as well. And in Ontario, we're working towards being accessible in 2025. And so we are way far behind in that regard. And so, um, but with the need to get the same message out to communities that don't have the same access to information, um, it, you, we've never seen it on the scale before. And that's amazing. And people have seen interpreters a lot more and they have favored interpreters now. And that's really cool. And so I hope that it brings a lot more people to the profession. And is that visibility staying a little bit more even outside of just COVID briefings? Or is it really kind of sticking to those specific messages? It's COVID briefings and it's musical interpreting. I know that there are portions of the deaf community that aren't big fans of the attention that um, concert interpreters get on social media. But, um, and, and, and I agree with them to an extent, I think there are pros and cons to it. But I think that that's the other big staying thing is people love to see their music interpreted in sign language because it brings the music to life in a visual way that is so different than listening to it. And is that because like you went to school uh, to be able to get an interpreter's license, I would guess, as it's called? We don't have that in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we are so far behind. So in the states, you have the, you have to have a a degree, mm -hmm. and then you have to pass a screening and be registered with the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. In most states, is my understanding. In Canada, you can voluntarily be a member of the national organization, um, which means that you pay an annual fee. There's a code of ethics and guidelines for professional conduct. There's professional development, et cetera, et cetera. And then they also have the ability to certify interpreters. You're not required to be certified. Um, and there are only about 60 interpreters in Canada that are because it is very difficult. It's like a years long process to get certified. But um, that's that. Many places at least require you to have an interpreter training program, diploma or certificate. And there are many places that say I work for as a freelance interpreter that have their own internal screening process to make sure that they're getting qualified interpreters because we don't have the systems in place to do that sort of Canada or even provincial wide. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. I, I just kind of like assumed since you mentioned going to school for it uh, and having that <laughs> advantage that, you know, there was a little bit more in place. No. There's nothing. <laughs> um, so, well, so my question was going to be, um, you know, the whole sign at music venues and concert, like, is that something that you would ever feel comfortable doing? Or is it kind of like, again, a different sort of language? So I do musical interpreting all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, there, I know that there are videos out there floating around of me interpreting. Um, I don't typically share unless I have permission from the individual who took that video or picture or whatever it is. Um, I don't typically share that kind of stuff. Like there's some fan expo things that because it was posted publicly on the fan expo pages and things like that. It's like, yes, everybody knows I was there because it was public. There were, you know, 150,000 of my best friends saw me at this event and then posted pictures of me and videos and whatnot. And so most of my work is confidential with concerts and things like that. It's a little bit different because they're so public and because people record and take pictures. Um, so I know that there's stuff floating around with me in it. Um, and it doesn't bother me. I'm fine with being videoed. Um, because I think the important thing is I always come to work to do the best work that I can. And, um, uh, I hope that if people see those videos, that they it piques their interest in sign language, in the profession, in the deaf community, if it can guide them to the deaf community. And in, at the end of the day, we have a more accessible society, then I'm very happy to be the person in the video. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you would want to talk about this because I feel like it's controversial. So we don't have to talk about it. Um, but I believe on TikTok, there has been some instances of people quote unquote signing um, when they're really not and that that is kind of like a big issue. So I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk about your reaction to that sort of 
behavior? Sure. So there's a couple of different levels to that kind of behavior. So there's the people that just flat out make a video of themselves just flapping their hands in the air, a la the interpreter at the Nelson Mandela Memorial, right? Like they're not actually saying anything. There's no um, linguistic elements. There's no grammar. They're just moving their hands and trying to make it look like they're signing. And that's really offensive. And they think that it is harmless, but the deaf community is a marginalized community. They are, they don't consider themselves to be a disabled community. They can't hear, but they're able to do everything else except hear that the hearing community can do. But the society at large considers them to be disabled. They have a communication barrier 100%, and that's making light of that. You can equate it to somebody doing an Asian accent. Nowadays, we know that that's completely unacceptable to do. And only the rare, rare person who apparently doesn't have the same internet that everybody else does might be caught doing something like that. But for the most part, 99% of the time, people aren't going to do that because we know that it's not okay anymore. But for some reason, with sign language, people aren't getting that message. And it's because they don't consider sign language equal to spoken language. And it is. Um, so it's just, it's not okay. Don't do it. The other level to that is people who are novice signers online teaching sign language. And that's also a big no, because um, sign language should be taught by deaf people, preferably. And if you are a novice signer, there are things that you are still learning. You are not qualified to teach because you don't know all of the elements. For example, there's five syntactic elements to sign language, um, to any sign language. And most of the novice signers that I see, they only get the sign, but they're missing, for example, the non-manual component on the face, or they have the grammar wrong, which is in your eyebrows. Those are things that are important. Only 30% of what you're conveying is through the signs alone. The rest of it is through your face and through your body. And those are important parts of the message. And novice signers don't get that. And so they should not be on social media teaching sign language. They should leave that to the deaf professionals. Also, the deaf community is un and underemployed a lot of the time. And the only jobs that they can find are jobs within the deaf field. And so let's leave that to the deaf community. <laughs> Very passionate about that. <laughs> yes, no, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Were your professional teachers when you were doing college deaf? So it depended on the class. If it was a semantics class, for example, then the instructors were deaf. But if it was on like billing or interpreter health and safety, then they were like the uh, hearing ASL English interpreter. So it just depended on the class. But we had a lot of deaf instructors and interpreter instructors in our program. And I, I believe, you, did you call them syntaxes? Is that what there were five of? Well, the five syntactic elements to, so there's the hand shape, mm -hmm. um, the palm orientation. So is your palm facing away from you? Is it facing the floor? Is it facing towards you? Hand shape, palm orientation, the movement of the sign. So for example, if you um, tap your hands once together or tap your hands twice together, that can change the word from a verb to a noun, vice versa. Um, Handshape, palm orientation, location of the sign. So, um, for example, the sign for mom and dad are the same handshape, same palm orientation, but one is on the forehead and one is on the chin. Um, and then the non-manual components. So, modifying the sign with your mouth, um, changing it from a statement to a question using your eyebrows, roll shifting using your shoulders to represent one person or another person. So, all of those things together work to create sign language. And that last one, I find like the most fascinating because like you don't, I think like unless you're learning it, you wouldn't really like know that that is part of it is for sure. I feel like that might be the most difficult to part to learn. Would that be true? I think so. I think that that is definitely one of the last components to come together when a student is going through an interpreter training program or they're a novice interpreter. Like they're still working on that non-manual component. Um, 
yeah, a lot of the time you'll see newer interpreters kind of have a more neutral expression on their face. Um, and then you'll see more seasoned interpreters or especially deaf interpreters because they're native users of the language. Um, they always get told that they're very expressive. If you see one on the news that was doing something that people thought was funny and they went viral, right? Because they're so expressive with their body and their face and they're exaggerated. And it's because it's a part of the language and it makes it more clear for the individual who's receiving the message. Right. Now, is sign language used like beyond the deaf community and also in the hard of hearing community? So the deaf community comprises of not in only individuals that are profoundly deaf, but hard of hearing, um, individuals with cochlear implants, individuals who were hearing earlier in life and became deafened and have chosen to learn sign language later in life. Like those are all um, interpreters can be members of the deaf community, CODAs, CODAs, SODAs, whatever other acronym of deaf adult. Um, they're all members of the deaf community. The important components are that you value deaf culture and that you are a sign language user. Um, yeah, so hard of hearing people can absolutely be are, and are part of the deaf community. All right. Yeah, I think I think it's kind of one of those like learning the right language. So it's like you've got the deaf community. Um, but then when you're talking about people who should be teaching sign language, is that more like they should specifically be deaf or just part of the deaf community? They should specifically be they can be hard of hearing or deaf. But the important thing is, have they been using sign language their whole life? Um, is it their first language? Are they fluent in the language? Do they value the deaf community? Are they a part of the deaf community? It's not just the language piece, but it's all those other pieces that come together. Um, there are some people who, who, and even some deaf people who say it's okay for CODAs to teach sign language because we have all of those things too, but I'm missing that deafness, right? Like I've been a member the whole my whole life. Sign language is my first language. I have deaf family members. I'm in the community. I volunteer. I work, et cetera, et cetera but I'm not deaf and I just don't get that piece of it. And I, I never will. I, I've seen my parents be oppressed and I have experienced bullying and discrimination because of my parents, but it hasn't been me, the one that is deaf, who has personally been experiencing that. It's a lot of vicarious um, mistreatment. And so I personally think that it is best left up to those individuals who have that lived experience. Right. And that makes a lot of sense. And was it was very well said and explained. Thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> sometimes I talk, sometimes I use a lot of words to say something very simple. <laughs> I, I think we all do that. Um, and we could probably all be be better at not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I specifically have any more questions that I want to ask. Um but I'd love to give you the chance to talk more about anything in terms of your experience, advocacy for the deaf community, or whatever you might want to talk about. Um, not really. I'm just, I'm so thankful that I have the privilege of having a platform um, on TikTok and social media um, to sort of be the bridge that I've always been my whole life between the hearing world and the deaf world. And if I can help by being a hearing person who is in the community and who has deaf family to um, help make people more aware and guide them to the right resources and the right people, I'm so thankful to be able to do that. And I'm so thankful that people care enough to follow me and comment and like and all of that kind of stuff. It's really cool. At Fan Expo, I had some people who follow me on TikTok come up to me and introduce themselves. And that was just really humbling and sweet and nice and almost made me cry like they told me their stories and it was just really sweet <laughs> yeah do you have any specific um recommendations for people if they want to learn asl so my recommendations are if you're going to learn online make sure you're using deaf resources so bill vickers on youtube is a great resource asl that is a great resource um, ASL Nook for kids is a really good one. Um, and Gallaudet University Press, I think, is another one. Those are all resources created by deaf individuals 
by qualified deaf instructors um, that can give you kind of the basics of sign language. But I always advocate for people to find a sign language class in their region so that you're picking up on the regional dialect of sign language of the deaf community that is local to you. And um, I mean, in America, I know that the restrictions are much less. Um, and so there are probably a lot more deaf events and things like that that are happening. Attend deaf events, volunteer where you can, um, be a part of that community. Don't just learn the language and leave, but integrate yourself within the community. You're going to learn the language faster. You're going to meet a lot of amazing people. Great. And I'll make sure to leave those resources in the description of this episode, along with on the website under my main resources page as well. Awesome. Now, at the end of every episode, I do ask a random question of my guests. Sure. Um, so my question of you, and I might have to change the answer, um, but because I am staring at it, uh, do you have a favorite Pokemon? Do I have a favorite Pokemon? I, I feel like this is such a basic answer, but I feel like <laughs> my favorite Pokemon is it's either Pikachu or Eevee. I know that that's like, ugh, but um, I just, I love Pikachu. And um, yeah, that's it. No, I'm sticking with it. Eevee and Pikachu. It's a tie. I don't care. <laughs> All right. That brings this episode to a close. As I mentioned, I will be leaving those resources that Vera mentioned in the description on good ways to start learning ASL and different resources. And I will also be leaving her TikTok, of course. So if you would like to check out the great uh, videos that she is sharing over there, I highly recommend going and giving her a follow. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description. That will bring you to all of our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And it'll also bring you to all of past resources, to past episodes, and it will also bring you uh, to the YouTube episodes of the podcast, which are released on the Sundays after the Tuesday episodes go live with closed captions as an option. And of course, if you would like to be a guest or support the podcast monetarily, that information is in the description as well. So thank you so much, Vera, for spending time with me today and for my, to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time, bye. Thank you so much for having me. Bye.